Hey there, short film fans. Welcome to another edition of the Cameo Launch Short Film Showcase, or if you're joining us from podcast land, welcome to the Cameo Launch Short Film Podcast. I'm your host, Nigel Morgan, and today we have the treat of all treats for you. Fair warning, I'm going to fanboy out this episode a lot. But before we uh, get going on all of that, um, just a quick reminder, if you're joining us from YouTube, then don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel. Also, don't forget to hit the bell for notifications of new content. If you're joining us by podcast, then you can subscribe by searching for Cameo Launch on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, iHeart, and more. Um, you can also find our entire show at cameolaunch.com slash podcast. Now... Our first guest has directed or co-directed short films that have blown us away time after time, starting back in 2015 with A Girl and Her Gun and following up with masterpiece after masterpiece, including Sunday Worship, Cell, Hungry Joe, Shiny, and now Old Windows, cementing his title as the most interviewed guest we've ever had on the show, Paul Holbrook of Short Films. Paul, welcome back. How you been? Hello, mate, mate. I'm, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for saying all that nice stuff. Yeah, no, it's all all true, all true, all true. Um, but also, if uh, if that's not enough for you, we have another guest, a first timer on the show, but has worked with Paul. If I've got my count right, five times, starting with a girl and a gun, and anchoring great films like Hungry Joe, Hollow, and now Old Windows, with performances that own every frame of screen time that she's in. in comparison to being the De Niro to Paul Scorsese or um, the Denzel to Paul Spike Lee. I think they're warranted. I think I, I think I can back that one up. And and if that's not enough, along with her latest appearance in the short film Old Window, she's also taken the reins as writer and producer. Um, so joining us for a long overdue first appearance on the show is Laura Based. And Laura, welcome to the show. So good to have you. How you been? I'm all right, thank you. Thanks for the that amazing intro. I love it. <laughs> Making me laugh. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely absolutely we've, we've had quite a few um successful collaborations there to be able to back up that that comparison so okay. I'm, I'm sticking with it nice one. um we're going to talk about those collaborations with um emphasis on hungry joe which is available online links in the description um and hollow which is still on the festival circuit and the link for our review for that is also in the description um, but we're really going to dig into your latest collaboration um, on the short film Old Windows um, that you collaborated on writing, I believe. And um, as we mentioned, Laurie co-produced alongside Jackie Howard. Um, and as I'm sure you've guessed, we have a link to our review for that in the description as well. Uh, but let's cycle back to the beginning. If we can talk a little bit about how you guys came to to work together initially back in, in 2015 for A Girl and a Gun. How, how did that initially come about? Are you going to answer, Paul? Uh, I'll start us off if you want. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no interesting answer really. She auditioned and got a job. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we just put a casting call out, and and yeah, Laura popped up on our radar. I, I don't even remember. It was so long ago. Did you do a video audition? I can't remember. I did. Yeah, I did do a video audition. I saw the um, like the casting breakdown. I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. Um, Knew nothing about Paul, knew only what was written down in front of me about the project, um, but thought I'd at least give it a go. And, and it went mm. from there and then consequently got cast in it. And so so here we are now. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. I mean, did you see a lot of projects like that kind of pop up on your radar or did this one stand out in any particular way? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, because at, um, at the time it was on one of these casting sites where it's just an inundation of um, short films and projects and and there are many, many, particularly on this particular casting website um, where a lot of them, I think you can just tell in the description and, and you know, you can tell the passion behind a project and sometimes you know that you've got to steer clear of them. Sometimes you don't always know and you end up making a mistake. But I think with this one, with Paul, it was quite obvious that it was, I don't know, something quite genuine and quite... Mm. There's a bit of a passion behind it, and um, and I really liked the role, and I really thought I could relate to it, and I knew I could do something with it. So that was quite exciting. Yeah, so I remember actually at the time um, when we initially wrote the review for A Girl and a Gun, we actually singled you out um, in terms of one of the things that really stands out about the film, because I remember watching it and just thinking, oh, she's horrible, oh, she's terrible, <laughs> but actually that means she's 
an amazing actor. I mean, she's like properly, properly nailed it because the the dynamics of that film, um, just in terms of between the characters, are just heart wrenching, heartbreaking, yeah. and you know you've really got to be able to to commit to it in order to pull that off. And also, um, Paul, because of the direction that, that you and Sam took with it in terms of setting the audience up to want the film to end in a particular way and then it ending in a different way and then leaving the audience thinking, why did I want it to end the way I wanted it to end? I'm being vague just in case anyone watching or listening hasn't watched it yet, so you can go watch it. Um, yeah, I mean, you really have to be able to commit to um, to that end, basically, and really being the kind of person that you want to see get their comeuppance or hope turns turns themselves around. Um, Paul, to you, was there a particular aspect or attribute you were looking for for the character that, that um, Laura ended up taking? Um, you're asking me to go quite far back. When was quite it, Laura? Like 2015? 2015, I think it was. Yeah, we're going back a bit. I mean, it's it's always just someone that can relate to the truth of what we're trying to do, I think, and someone that's grounded and down to earth and someone that feels part of that world, whether that's, you know, in real life or just through life experience in the past or, or a, a kind of general understanding of where these kind of characters, you know, live and breathe in the world. And I think, I mean, if I remember rightly, of, the, of, of all the videos we got for that, it was pretty much nailed on to be Laura, like right from the start. Because mm. the, the thing is, when when you cast those kind of, um, you know, essentially working class roles or whatever, working class characters, so many actors, whether it's just instinctive or you know they didn't even know they're doing, they do just resort to stereotypes when they deliver their performance. Do you know what I mean? Um, whereas when Laura does things, it just feels a lot more human. It doesn't necessarily feel like a, a character, especially a cartoony character. Like, you know, you, they can go, actors can sometimes go quite cartoony with working class stereotypes. Get out of my pub or whatever, like all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Or what the fuck are you looking at? Or fucking not, like, all that silly stuff that is yeah, just, yeah. Is, is, is shallow. Yeah, I just, I just, I think, I think just in Laura, you just saw a, an actual fully formed character right from the, right from the off rather than something we would have to, 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 to kind of tone down. Mm -hmm. And as you were kind of going through that process and, and the film starts to come together, at what point were you like, right, I've got to work with Laura again? Was that, or was it a case of making the decision during the filming of that? Or was it more a case of when the next thing started to be developed? You think, oh, actually, Laura might be a good person to get in on that. So I, did it I, I, I think, to be totally honest, in the first instance, it was just because Laura was the first actress that I found I could really relate to on a creative level. Our tastes aligned, our kind of um, instincts aligned, I think, character-wise, story-wise. It was just, it was, e it, it was easy. Like, it's difficult. Like, I think working with actors, when we, when we first started out, working with actors was one of the most difficult things because you, don't re you feel like there are rules, maybe, or... It's kind of um, the idea of working with an actor kind of needs to be dem demystified. We did this before, Laura, because it, it's just mm. talking. It's just communicating a vision and, and talking and digging deep and finding where you want that character to go. Um, whereas sometimes when you first start out, you're like, oh, working with actors, I don't know how to talk to actors. And sometimes you kind of put on this fakery when talking to actors, like, oh, yeah, I'm the director, I'm going to do this, this is what I want you to do, whatever it might, may be. This kind of idea of what a director does, you kind of pretend to be it. And I think when we first worked with Laura, I was just kind of like, oh, you don't need to pretend because she's normal like us. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it just became a more human experience working with her. It's it a real collaborative like a thing. An actor thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, 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 it's sorry it's a real collaborative thing like I don't think as an actor you should make all the decisions um before you step on set you need to obviously do re your research and you need to really think long and hard about the character what's happening what's happening before what's happened before what's happening after where you are in the moment and all that kind of stuff you need to obviously know all that and you need to be really constantly thinking about it but you can't go making decisions and go right well I'm gonna play it like this and then I'm gonna try that and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna stick with it because it's about being truthful and honest and I like to find my directors and I, ju I generally just say right talk to me like five minutes before we're about to start shooting that scene 
and it has to be that scene that we're about to start shooting. I just want, I just want to listen. I don't want to say too much, and I just want to hear what where they're at with it and what they think and how they see it, you know. And then I try and take that all on board, and then by the time we've done that, we're pretty much ready to to start maybe shooting the first take, you know. I mean, as a job in actor, Laura, how common is it to be able to find directors that you can easily do that with? Um, it's not always easy. Some directors do what I've just said. They're very sort of stuck and they want things in a particular way and there's not much room for movement. And when that happens, um, you pick up on that quite quickly and you're like, OK, this is how we're doing this today. That's fine. We'll, we'll do it that way. And you just, you know, try your best to keep it truthful. Um, but I find in the indie industry, um, act, uh, directors tend to be more open to working with actors um, in terms of getting on their level and finding out where you're at. And that all comes with discuss- discussion and talking and just going through it, you know? Okay. Okay. And how um, important is that in terms of kind of creating a sustainable career in acting it's not the easiest thing to kind of build a a um career in you spend a lot of time doing stuff for low pay or no pay before getting those those other jobs so how how important is it to be able to find those directors that you can have that collaborative relationship with when you're actually building that career i think it's really important i think it's about trusting your gut instinct and it's about knowing who is the right director for you or what, what is the right project for you? Um, I mean, I'm lucky that I, I mean, I do get sent a lot of short films and a lot of scripts, um, particularly when something's come out and, and I tend to get a lot of scripts that are similar in vain and, and a lot of them are okay. Some of them really stand out and when they do, you know, I'll look into it a bit more. Um, but I just think it's about having a good instinct with yeah. people and I can generally tell even from an email I can tell whether I want to work with that person or not all right do you know what I mean I mean it's, it's to both of you I mean how important is it to to kind of cultivate those sort of grassroots filmmaking communities in order to create those opportunities and establish those relationships that might move you forward you've had to kind of get a feel for individuals and as you said Laura you get a lot of stuff through for short film and you feel a bit more at home um in an indie setting kind of working yeah. collaboratively with the director so yeah. for for both of you how how important is it to kind of cultivate those kinds of grassroots communities to to get those projects up and running and to move things forward paul do you want to chime in with that one i mean it's a the indie scene it's a good breeding ground isn't it it's a good, a good breeding ground to kind of find your feet in regards to what your tastes are the people you like to work with you find your tribe um and the more you do it, the better you get at it. Like that's just essentially, and I think the more confident you get at it, the more confident you get to engage with things on a personal level. When you first start out, I think a lot of young filmmakers and maybe actors too, they come at it with a preconceived idea of what the job is. And, and actually, essentially, filmmaking as, or storytelling in general is just communicating what you're trying to get across to other people and and helping other people and and making the floor open for other people's expertise and talents to fuel your idea, your vision, your story. Mm -hmm. And I think in that that kind of um, bubble, that creative bubble, at this at, at the lower level, you can make mistakes and it's okay. It's not gonna it's not gonna kill you, it's not gonna finish you, it's okay to make mistakes and learn from them and go again. Um, And like I said, I think like Laura said, you you hone your instincts. And sometimes it sounds like such a simplified way to say it about making films, but our instincts are important. Like that's what makes us us. That's what makes our taste stars. That's what makes our films eventually kind of fit authored. So Mm -hmm. it's okay just to trust your instinct. You don't need to kind of Mm -hmm. um, sit down and learn a, a complete set of rules of what it takes to be a filmmaker, a director or an actor. It's engaging emotionally, psychologically, personally with your instincts and with the other people that you're working with. Like that's essentially, you could you can boil it down to that. Obviously, there are a load of technical things you might want to learn along the way and structure and pace and whatever else, all the other things that go into making a film. But if you boil it all down, it's communicating your instincts to other people. That's it. And it's a lot easier to do that in a collaborative arena like the indie filmmaking scene. Yeah, because instinctiveness is 
is you can't really control that, can you? Therefore, it's truthful. Therefore, it's honest. And that's what I always try and put a, across in any sort of performance. It has to come from somewhere. Um, and that's generally something instinctive. But practically, the indie industry, like Paul says, it's a great breeding ground for for learning and getting that, that experience because it is a really difficult industry. And um, for some actors, it's the only way in. When you kind of lean into that then, when you then do start to um, you know, develop those tribes and, and um, work in, in those kinds of environments, do you find that the industry kind of tends to then follow you? Is it attracted to um, communities of filmmakers that are already kind of self-sustaining? In, in that sense, I mean, because, um, Paul, you went from doing short comedy sketches to to funding things like um, The Girl and a Gun and, and Hungry Joe to then getting backing for um, Hollow and uh, and Old Windows. So, have, did you find that the industry kind of found you after you'd kind of proved a sort of self sustaining community can exist? So, Hollow was funded by the Pitch, which is another industry body. Um, and Old Windows was funded by Laura's production company. But I think you're right in what you're saying. Yeah, I think the more you do it and the better you get at something, um, not only are you finding your tribe, but you're finding your standards as well. Mm. And you're seeing where you can raise them. So when you work with people, you know, your first film, and everybody else is also climbing the ladder at the same time, everybody else is also getting better at what they do. So standards are always being raised. And then sometimes along the way, you just go, that, that person's kind of plateaued. And I still see another level of standard or what have you. So let's try and bring somebody in that can raise that 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 element of, of filmmaking for us. And, mm. and gradually, as you go, your stuff gets better. You start working yeah. with better actors, better DPs, better technical crew, better everything, you know. Um, as long as you can look back at your previous work and dissect it and understand why certain things didn't work or how certain things can be better, and then you work really hard to make sure you make that aspect better in your next film, you're not going to stay invisible forever, right? So, you know, the likes of yourself are are banging reviews out about our films and throwing them out online. And and before you know it, it all just kind of, it might just feel like one singular film, but as your portfolio grows and your tribe grows and your standards get higher, it's impossible for you to be invisible because there's so much of you out there. Do you know what I mean? And then you're going to attract, you know, more established people that want to work with you. Um, And I think also as well, you've, you've then got, you've then got a bit of clout behind you that you can go to people and go, well, hang on a minute, shouldn't you be funding me because I've done all, I've paid my dues, I've done all this on my own. Is it now about time the industry gives us a bit of support? And, you know, that that isn't arrogance or, or, or being obnoxious. That's that's essentially saying, I've done all this. Can you just have a look and tell me if you think it's any good? And yeah. if it is, and you've constantly raised your standards, it will be, and you'll start making different kinds of relationships. Because right. you start talking to different people who have different jobs in the industry, you start recognizing what the structure of these decision makers companies are. Mm. So you start talking to development assistants or development execs or producers or CEOs or whatever it may be. Um, and the more of those type of friends you have, again, when you get a project going, there are a few more inboxes you can throw it in. Essentially. Right. Mm. Okay. That was a really long answer to your question. But... <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, it makes it makes perfect sense to me because things do naturally change and develop the more you do something as you said the better you, better you get at it for me um when i watched hungry joe for the first time that kind of represented a, a step up from what from what i already considered to be really good short film there was a definite step up in terms of standard quality um the acting was particularly powerful and you know you could really see that you're now starting to use technical skill to play around with style with tone and all that kind of stuff so what were some of the challenges that came along with that step up that you hadn't um, had to deal with previously i think there's a bit more pressure in regard in regards to the standards people are going to expect so when you know you're when you know you're stepping up or at least you're trying to if you fail that's going to be quite obvious you know Mm. there's always the worry that you're going to make your next film's going to be a bad one so that's always a worry you know the expectation if, 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 if there's a trajectory that you're on and the standards get higher so does mm-hmm. the um sense of uh 
or, or, or sense of awareness that there's there's an expectation to what your next film is going to be or if it's going to be any good. Do you know what I mean? So that mm-hmm. that's always. I mean, that's just a human thing, isn't it? Every yeah, film I do yeah. until I go in with a, you know, my stomach going over as to whether it's actually any good. But again, that's another reason why you find your tribe because you get people, you know, you, you can run ideas past me. Like me and Laura throw ideas to each other and we'll sit and look at a script and we'll talk about it. And the more people you can convince that it's a good idea and that you trust their opinion, the more confidence that gives you to believe that it is and do your best work. Um, the fundamentals of filmmaking and storytelling don't change. Mm. Yeah. Depending on how, how many fancy toys you've got on set or how many celebrities you've got on set. It doesn't change. The fundamentals of storytelling remain the same. So I think as long as you commit to that, you, you're going to be okay. But yeah, you look around and you've got bigger toys. You look over there and there's, you know, a guy off the telly or, or whatever. Yeah. And it can make you think, oh, am I out of my depth here? But as long as you reconnect with what it is that made you want to tell that story in, in the first place, then you'll be fine. Because you're confident, you've done the development, you're confident enough to communicate your ideas and your themes and, and your vision for the piece. And as long as you've got that confidence, it doesn't really matter who you're communicating it to, whether they're super famous mm-hmm. or it doesn't really matter if you're using, you know, a shitty little DSLR camera or a, or a massive cinema camera. It's fundamentals are, are the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And for, for me, it's not looking at all the sparkly stuff. So it's because um, Hungry Joe has, you know, since has been put into this category of horror. But when I read the script, I never saw horror. Um, and when I was playing, you know, Laura, the character, it was never in my head, oh, we're making a horror film. It was just a game. It was trying to keep really truthful to the human story. And that is a mum that essentially really loves her son, but just finds it really difficult. And, um, and that was it, really. It wasn't about anything else. It was just trying to keep that story really um, grounded. Right. So, I mean, fun, it sounds like fundamentally um, the acting process for you is the same as going back to A Girl and a Gun, although we're talking about two different characters entirely, but you're still kind of searching for the authenticity of why that character is the way they are or why they um, they take the, the role that they take within that particular story. It doesn't, it doesn't um, seem like there's much of a change or, or, or was there a, a um, fundamental shift with, with Hungry Joe? No, I think you're right. It has to come, it always comes from the inside out. <laughs> so sort of it's in there and then it gradually finds its way out. So I can't sort of physically approach a character without thinking about what's going on inside first because whatever's going on inside creeps out to the physical. Do you know what I mean? If you're feeling depressed tomorrow, you're not going to walk around with your shoulders back and your head held high going, hey, guys, you know, you, you might be feeling that in your head and inside and it will start to creep out on you physically and you'll start to feel a bit heavier and a bit smaller and your head will be down. And it's all those sorts of things that I, I'm more, I'm as an actor, I'm more interested in and then uh, trying to understand the story and the process and why that's affecting the character in that way. If that makes any sense, it makes sense to me. <clears throat> but yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. It's, it's, it's the same as filmmaking. It's, it's what, what Laura. <clears throat> um, sometimes you can get carried away with the idea that you're making a genre film, yeah, and therefore you've got to tick certain genre boxes, or you've got to appease the audience in a certain way. Like we all know why we love genre films because they're fun, but that kind of like fun or flair that you put into it, it should never be at the expense of that kind of emotional depth that Laura's talking about. Like, that is what makes... When you watch something, that's what makes it stick with you. That's what makes it feel whole, and it makes it feel a lot deeper than just the gore or blood and guts that you're seeing. Yeah. Or sometimes if you're making a horror, there's an expectation. You go, oh, cool, there's going to be blood, there's going to be guts, there's going to be this crazy stuff going on. And that's what you're expecting as probably an audience member. But we kind of always want to aim to do something a bit more deeper than that to affect the audience on a more emotional level than just they're scared or they're repulsed or whatever it may be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because, I mean, with films in general, they tend to be sold on the premise of whatever genre they are. You know, if you if you see a, um, a trailer for a superhero movie, you're sold on the premise of, okay, there's going to be superpower people, there's going to be explosions, there's going to be special effects, there's going to be this, that, and the other. But whether or not you come away having enjoyed it or not depends on whether or not they've actually laid into it an actual story for you to follow or an actual character journey for you to follow, but you're never going to sell the film based on the character journey. Um, and I think 
Sam um, brought it up last time the two of you were on, actually, in that, you know, you can watch Hungry Joe as just a genre film if you want to. You can just watch it as a horror film if you want to, and it works. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean you don't put in the the internal character struggle because that does come from the inside out, as you were saying, Laura. Um, and the best use of genre is to take the, the sort of elements of that genre, be it the blood and guts of horror or the special effects of science fiction, and make that an extension of the character. So as you see the house start to um, become less and less unkempt in in Hungry Joe, as you start to see more of the grime, as you start to see Joe get worse and worse, um, that's an extension of where the characters are at. Yes. And you can see immediately that this is a character decline. It's not just you've got to make it look grimy because genre. Uh, and I think that worked, worked really well. And the um, subject matter that you kind of layer into it, which is based very much in, in real world social issues as well, gives you something to grab onto. And whether or not you're watching it as just a genre film or um, for something a bit more, the, the material's there. There's something there for, for, for the audience to to really sink the teeth into and I think that that really works quite well we've talked a lot about Hungry Joe I'm gonna move on but <laughs> <laughs> before I do um you mentioned a while back there are there any kind of next steps for that or feature film plans is that still in development or um are there other projects that you're that you're kind of working towards at the minute uh, yes I mean Hungry Joe the feature is written and it's been optioned by a by a pretty cool production company up north um hey. and they're currently out doing their thing, trying to raise the funds, but um, yeah, I mean, fingers crossed we can get that into production. You know, sooner rather than later. But yeah, you know, it's it's, it's the finance that needs to be put in place first. But yeah, it's there, it's ready to go, um, and it's brilliant. But we just have to uh, wait for that green light. Well, keeping fingers crossed and keep us in the loop because we definitely want to be uh, promoting yeah. that for you as soon as that uh, is ready to drop. Now, moving on to, I'm just, I'm just going to touch on Hollow briefly because we had a bit of a conversation about that. But um, from an acting perspective, how, actually from a filmmaking perspective as well, you, you, you're both um, parents, I believe. So how difficult was it as a parent to go to, to the places that the character needs to go to, the story needs to go to, given what that, that film's about? Um, I'll answer this, shall I? Um... It's the same process, really, that um, I try and use for, for everything. Um, but, of course, being a mum, because I am a mum, I've got two kids, um, you can use that as a... You can relate to it more. Um, and, you know, and I've got experience with loss as well, so I can relate to that. Um, I think, for me, Hollow, it was really important that the character... I re it was really, really important for me that I really did start from, from the inside and work my way out because by the end of that, there was really nothing left of that character. She really was quite hollow. Um, you know, there was a sense of, um, well, there was this sense of loss and abandonment and, you know, grief and anger. And, and I think it was really important for me to feel that phys physically, you know, as me as Laura Baston so that I could really bring that into into the character and I was really lucky that I had that script early on and I was really lucky that I had a lot of time to spend asking question after question after question with Paul and really getting a good understanding of what was happening and why and what it meant and all of the same things what's happened before what's happening after what's happening now and and just trying to play off that that just emptiness. And for me, that was just hunger. I got into that character, uh, not eating probably for about three months and losing weight and just going on set absolutely hungry. So there was this little bit of my brain as well that was kind of fighting against everything else. This this hunger, this um, sense of loss, this need for something else that I couldn't get. Um, and it really helped me. And I don't know if it would help anybody else, but it helped me get into the character and it gave me a bit of, um, it just put you on edge a little bit, you know? And that's the thing, isn't it? It's, like, it's, it's not, so, you know, it's, it's a revenge thriller, essentially, hollow. And I think most people can just simply relate to 
um, what revenge means and why people want revenge and that anger that comes with it. But when you've got time with an actor to really kind of dig deep underneath what those emotions mean, you start finding conflict. Mm. You start, you know, you start finding ways to explore violence, revenge, religion, fear, anger, all these things mm. on a more personal level, yeah. rather than just going, yeah, what it is, you're super angry because your kid's been killed. You know, that's the guy that did it. You know what anger feels like, so be angry because you want to kill him. Like that's mm. the surface level is very simple. Yeah. Yeah. But then when you get to sit down, you go, yeah, but what does that anger mean? Where does it come from? What does it feel like? What what what's the uh, what's the devil on your shoulder saying? What's the angel on your shoulder saying? And all these things m- moving around in somebody's stomach and in someone's brain. Mine and Laura's. When you're developing the character in the story, you get all this fuel. Me and her, you get all this fuel to work with when you get on set mm. because you've spent this time really exploring what all these surface level emotions actually mean and feel mm. like inside and then that comes out in the performance that comes out in the in the shot choices that comes out in everything that comes out in our conversations with the dp with the with the production designer with the producers with everything i mean that's that time is a luxury you don't always have it um but again that's probably another reason why i like to work with laura because she almost demands that she needs that and i need that as well mm. so we always mm. spend a lot of time you know in counselling with each other, like just talking about, <laughs> yeah, you know, just talking on a really deep emotional level about what all this stuff means and where it comes from. For me, it's just really important to try and stay in the headspace and to not be, um, and to have that luxury of, of being able to stay in that zone and that headspace and not be influenced by too many externals. And I don't mean, I don't mean going into method acting, which I don't do, but I do think there's a, there's elements of it that you really should. Um, pay attention to because you can't you can't be going into the green room and having a good old chat with someone when you're about to go and do a scene that's um you know that's really quite intense you do need yeah. to find that and, and 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 not to lose that physicality as well you've got to keep that physicality the whole time you know th- and feel it as well not just think about it but really feel it and walk with it and sit with it and sleep with it and everything with it and then you'll find it easier to maintain. And then it's not, you're not just, um, you know, on action. You're not looking for it. You shouldn't step on set not ready. You should have found that, yeah. you know, a week ago. Um, so I think it's important when you're doing a film like Hollow, if you've got the luxury of time and space to really try and just um, switch off from everything else and just hone in on it. And it mm. does help. It does help with the performance and just makes it a bit easier. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, there's there's a lot going on there with every single character in it, you know, and there's this sort of um, really uneasy dynamic of wanting to express in a rage and then have and then somebody else having to suppress in a rage and then somebody else being rageful to mask yet more. destructive emotion going on internally as well i mean this is probably i think this is the first time i think um or one of your films has directly addressed race as well mm. and that being directed at um uh carl collins character who is a um a reverend in the story and has to kind of not unleash the kind of rage reaction that, that will come along to that kind of treatment um again is that another um area that you took the time to explore with him while while kind of working through the, the dynamics of the story. Yeah, I mean, I didn't have as much time with Carl, Carl as I did with Laura. Um, but yeah, we'll sit down. I mean, I, you know, I'm a white man, so I, I don't know what it feels like for people to be racist to me. But obviously Carl probably does. Um, so we had lots of long conversations about what that feels like and what it means. And at the same time, I had flip side conversations with one of our producers who is a vicar. So you're starting to you're starting to bring in God's voice into the mix. Right. Or you, could, you could call that morals, or you could call that empathy. You could call that whatever you want. Call that the law if you like. Um, and then Carl's opinion or thoughts and feelings of how racism feels to him. And then if you put both of those things into a character that we've created that we know has this inner rage and, and a capability of violence it starts all swirling together and creating a really interesting character. Yeah. So it's just a yeah. case of sitting down with that actor and talking out all those different elements 
it doesn't matter that I'm not black. I still know what it, what it means to have an anger inside you that you can't, you don't quite know what to do with. It, you know, it might be might come from a different place to Carl, um, but the emotion is very similar. Um, and it's just being honest and talking and, and making sure the floor is open to to the actors' ideas because. In the same way, I need to personally relate to a story or the characters to do my job. They obviously do as well. Mm. So it's just finding ways for everybody to personally attach themselves to what we're trying to do and making sure that every, every actor has all that information as every side of the dice swirling around inside their head and in their belly mm. um, before we get to set. And then if, if you do that well enough, then by the time these actors get to set, they have so many ideas of how to deliver it and they have so much kind of emotion already going on, it kind of makes your job as directing quite easy because they're already kind of mm. wound up and ready to go because you've spent weeks with them winding them up. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the right kind of way. And then they get to set, you unleash them, they do a thing, and it's only very then, then very small tweaks or little reminders about conversations we might have had a week ago. Oh, remember we talked about this? Or Like I can remember, for example, in Hollow, we were doing a scene with Carl, where he had this rage, and it's when he, he, he hits the guy and he goes in and he wants to kill the guy or whatever. And before we shot the thing, it was just a case of saying to Carl, right, so you know where, you know, you could see that he was pent up and he was ready to, to do the action and the fight scene or the, the rage was there. And it was just a case of going, I'll oh, just go and take five minutes with Luke, who is our producer and is also a vicar. To get in his ear and remind mm. him what God sang like, do you know what I mean, or what, or what the the, the right. conflicting voice in his head sang like. So then suddenly, when he did that scene, he's got Luke's voice and the voice of this inner anger going on, and then it makes his performance feel really loaded up with something. And that's just a brief, that's, you know, it's a five minute reminder. But yeah, it's just it's just making sure actors, myself, everybody creatively involved are feeling all these little conflicts yeah. going on inside. Mm. I guess it's about having the time to explore it ahead of time, really, isn't it? And once you're actually on set, as you say, there's a limited amount of time to really do these things. So it, you, you take the time ahead of time to kind of develop that short. Yeah. It, it's being willing to put the work into development as well, because mm. there's no point in, in faking it and lying about it. If yeah. you're not finding a personal connection or you're not finding a reason why you have to make this film, if you're not finding the things that are keeping you awake at night as you're getting towards action mm. then you need to put the work in to find it i don't think you can cheat that that stuff and i think when you do cheat it that's when films can end up feeling quite shallow mm. like the superhero films you're talking about mm. you know, some of them yeah. stick with you and you don't quite know why it's a subconscious reaction you don't quite know why they're doing the same things but when the character development's done and you're giving the audience something to emotionally psychological relate psychologically relate to yeah. those ones are the ones that you stick with and that they're the ones that stay with you and they're the better ones, you know? Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, it's all the way back to style or substance in it. Yeah. Just, just make, make sure there is a lot more substance and style. Just make sure there's substance, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so moving on to old windows then. Um, so it's on the festival circuit right now. Brand new. You guys are working together again. So this one is uh, produced by Jack and Law Films. Um, so, Laura, do you want to tell us a little bit about the formation of, of your production company, how it came into existence, why you decided to establish it, and your partnership yeah. with, uh, with Jackie, yeah? Um, yeah, so, like all of these things that happened recently, um, lockdown came about and had a bit more free time on my hands, and I had this idea of this character, Harry, that I'd had for a long time, actually, and I had a script that had been knocking about on my laptop called There's Something About Harry. <laughs> and I and I thought, well, I really need to do something with this. And so um, I did, and I got a, a script together and got it across to Paul. And um, luckily, he kind of liked it and saw something in it. And so we spent a bit of time together on Zoom, just sort of polishing it up and, uh, you know, really getting it nice and tight. Uh, at that point, I'd never thought about a production company. I'd never thought that I would even make it. I just thought, well, it'd be, won't it be nice to have a good script that I've written? I never really thought too much about, wouldn't it be great if we shot it? I mean, obviously, I always thought it would be great, but I never thought we would. Um, and then as time progressed, we started talking more about, well, maybe we should think about, you know, shooting it. 
And so we did, and well, I did. And then uh, Jackie, so my producing partner, Jackie, comes into it because um, I directed a play a couple of years back, which Jackie stage managed at a, a local theatre, um, which kind of kept in touch. And we um, knew each other through, through the theatre mainly. Um, but she's got a great love of film. She's an amazing photographer. Um, so she's always had a really good eye for, you know, film and stuff. Um, I was telling her about the project, um, Old Windows, and, you know, what I was thinking about doing with it. And she just was like, I want to come on board. I want to help. I want to get involved and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So she came on board um, as a producer. We ended up making the film. And then it was only once the film was shot and made that we were like, oh, well, I guess we need to kind of get this out there. <laughs> we need we need a production company, don't we? Uh, yeah. So we ended up putting a putting our heads together. And it's actually my daughter, Ava, that came up with the name. Oh. Um, Jack, Jack Law, obviously Jackie and Law. Jackie's one of the very few people that calls me Law because I get really annoyed. People call me Law. I'm like, it's Laura. But for some reason, I let her get away with it. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, so that so Jack Law was born, and um, and yeah, it's a real fledging production company. But we're really excited about it, and we've got a few other things in pre-production, a few things in development, and um, we're really sort of proud that it's two women that are you know mm. pushing it forward and and getting projects off the ground. And um, Old Windows just happens to be the first one. And the instigator of it all. So with Paul's help, obviously. Yeah, I mean it's great. I, I think it's fantastic because there's there's kind of a necessity to to create these things off your own back a lot of the time. I mean, if uh, particularly in, in the case of of this film where you have an idea yourself, okay, how do I get it out there? Um, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about previously um, about building relationships and cultivating sort of grassroots communities um i mean without people that you'd worked with on sort of that level i guess it would have been that much more difficult to to push the story forward i suppose wouldn't it yeah absolutely it would have been so much more difficult but um but that's what this is all about it's about building relationships with people it's about choosing the right people to work with it's about having that um that uh, paul uses the word quality control and knowing who the right people are to work with as in who do you connect with and for me that's Paul um but also don't get me wrong this industry for an older actress is really really tough and the doors ain't just closed they are bolted shut with people sat behind them you ain't getting nowhere so for a lot of time a lot of the time you've got to create your own content and you've got to find ways to get it out there and create and be creative um and start to knock on start building your own doors because you know you can sit around all day long hoping for the phone to ring I can tell you now it will never ring you can have a great agent there are so many so many thousands and thousands hundreds of thousands of actors out there it's such a competitive industry more than ever um so you know you can get bitter and twisted about it and think oh you know why am I not getting seen for this why am I not getting seen for that and I have (laughs) <laughs> but mm. at the same time it's not going to help you so you have to go well what can I do about it well I can write something and then I'll film it and then I'll get it out there and you get that creative buzz and you get that creative thing out and you're doing something not just for you but for other people as well that can enjoy the film and you know you're employing people to work on your film and it's yeah. it's a whole creative process and everyone's getting involved and it's just such a positive and great thing to be a part of and Paul has just been instrumental because he's he's really encouraged and he's supported um and pushed me and Jackie to really go for it and given us so many ideas and I couldn't have done it without him really he'll he'll moan now and go oh it's not true Laura but it is (laughs) well Paul what is that like for you now being in a position where before you know you were kind of working up to a particular level now being able to enable Laura and and other people to establish their own um organizations and and um start building their own projects and telling their own stories what's that like for you now as as somebody that's had to go through that process being able to help someone do that I mean they, they Laura's helped me in equally as many ways as I've helped her over the last 10 years so she's being too humble 
Um, I think it's just, it's like Laura says, you, you can you can sit back and moan about how difficult this industry is, and it is really difficult, and those moans are warranted, and you can you can you can try and find ways to affect change. Um, but at the same time, you have to have this kind of rebellious streak where you are not going to give up. And you're, if, if you feel invisible, you're going to do everything you can to make yourself not invisible. I'm going to yeah. do good work. I'm going to get it out there. You're not going to ignore me because yes. we're going to get great reviews and we're going to play the great festivals and you're not going to be able to ignore me. You know, when the industry says, well, you need to do some good short films before we can take this. Well, I've done that. You need to play the right mm. festivals. For, well, I've done that. You need to win the right awards. We've done that. What mm. next? You know, yeah. you, have to, you have to keep doing that. And and I think with Jackalor Films, you know, it started off, yeah, it just started off as a script that was great. And it had two really interesting characters. And, you know, it might have been 20 pages too long, but the story was there. Um, and then it's more of a case of, of recognising drive in somebody else. Look, I haven't done anything other than just to say, just I haven't done anything to, other than to say, go for it. That's all I've done. <laughs> but if, but if Laura and Jackie, you know, trust my judgment or can take my word for it, and that that does empower them to believe believe a bit more in themselves, then great. But but it it was the quality of the project and the quality and, and the fact that Laura and Jackie have um, really an insatiable drive that made it happen. Yeah. I, I, I was more, I, I didn't do much, Nigel. I. I <laughs> I did my job as a director. Um, they they did their job as writers and producers. Um, yeah, and everybody else did their job to make a good film. But it was it was a no brainer that Paul was going to direct it because he just got it from he just got it everything about it the tone the vision the, you know the visual side of it the everything he was in that world with me and he saw it how I saw it so. You know. And that's the thing with trust, isn't it? Like, if Laura yeah. comes to me with that script, mm. and I go, nah, Laura will trust my opinion, and then she'll go, okay, we'll work. But it, and, and vice versa, if I go, it's great, but it's not for me. And yeah. if I go to Laura, but it's something, she goes, nah, not for you. It's, it's just and trust. We've, been, it's, we've had that before. I've been to Paul with scripts and vice versa, and it hasn't worked out for whatever reason. It's fine. You just move mm. on. Just move on yeah. to the next thing. Yeah. No, and this, and what, I, what I found really interesting about this film in particular is after... Um, sort of the back-to-back of Hungry Joe, Shiny, um, Hollow, those three films, you know, they're quite large in scale, um, even though, you know, something like Shiny is quite more, is, is quite a lot more lighthearted than the other two. It's still quite large in scale. You know, you've got multiple acts, you've got multiple locations, you've got a whole f- physical yeah. as well as emotional journey going on in there. Um, what I found interesting about this is that it scaled all of that down. It's a single location, it's two characters for the whole film. But at the same time, you then were able to build out a whole history through suggestion rather than exposition dumps. Um, yeah. and just through how these two characters interacted with each other and trying to, you know, put the audience in the position of trying to figure out who this guy is that's just walked into this calf. And and also, what is the backstory of this lady who we thought we knew everything we needed to know about? It opens, you know, she's just locking up for the day, cleaning up, and she seems like a regular person. The way she's presented seems like, okay, we know everything we need to know about her. All the mystery kind of seems with the other guy, but as the more he talks, you're thinking, actually, there's more mystery with with uh, the, the cafe owner as well. So I thought that was really interesting about, about the film. So was that one of the conversations that you had when you were working on the script together as to how to kind of expand on what from a physical perspective is quite a small scale idea, building that out into a, into a larger history. Was that one of the objectives or did that, did that just kind of naturally come with the development of the story? I guess Hold Winders, like on the surface, it does seem like a really simple story and a really simple kind of idea but I was just always really interested in what was bubbling away under the surface, you know, and what wasn't being said. Because we've all been in then situations and we've all seen and witnessed these kind of conversations, particularly where I grew up and, you know, where you just look at people and you think, what are they? Yeah, but what's really going on? What, you know, mm. this superficial conversation is fine, but what's what's really being said? And it's those little things that really sort of draw you in. 
even if you're just sat in a cafe having a cup of tea and you're listening to the old geezers behind you having this conversation and you can't help but sort of be leaning in going, what, was I, what did he just say what I think he said? I love all that because I'm quite nosy, really. Quite, I, quite, I find people interesting and I tend to do that in cafes. I'm always looking at other people. I want to get involved in their conversations. Um, mm. But, yeah, I guess with old windows also... I was I was mindful that if I was going to bother writing something, even though I thought I'd never get to do it, that it had to be feasible and to shoot something that was in one location with two actors was going to be a damn sight easier than, you know, shooting something in multiple locations with all sorts of actors. So there was that. Um, but this conversation, I don't know, I just... I love, I just, I just like the fact that you've got, as a viewer, you've got to really concentrate and work at Mm -hmm. what's really going on. There's the superficial conversation and then there's something completely different. Um, That's how I see it anyway. Don't know about Paul. Yeah, I mean, it was, (laughs) the development of that project was constantly us trying to load up the subtext constantly and and to strip more and more dialogue away and leave it unsaid. to be honest, old, old, old Windows, for me, it's the simplest film I've ever done, but it's 100% the most challenging as well because you, you didn't have... I find it really difficult, really, really difficult. In post, I find it difficult. On set, I find it difficult. In development, I find it difficult because you don't have the, the, the stuff that you can kind of fall back on. Like when we're talking about horror and thrillers, you have some stuff you can fall back on. You can do some fancy lighting. You can do a shot of a knife. You can get some funky music in there. You know, you can throw some gore at it. There are other, other, other elements at play. If you don't quite get this thing right, well, at least they've got that thing. With, with old windows, all we had was the dialogue. That's essentially all we had um, on the page anyway. So it was always going to be a challenge. So we knew we needed to shit our actors. That's when Larry came into it. Um, and I knew we always needed that conversation to be really engaging for the audience. The audience had to be able to lean in. We knew it was going to be about, you know, 15, 20 minutes worth of dialogue. That has potential to be really boring, right? So we had to give the audience enough kind of, enough in the subtext to really make them squint and lean in and try and understand what was really being yeah. said. So we stripped so much dialogue out in, in the development of that. And then when it came to shooting it, it was, what can we do to make this visually interesting and make sure that there's, an energy change and make sure there's actual dynamic in those energy changes as you know so so we added the dance scene at the start for example so we start with a big bit of energy and then that energy is gradually sucked out of the room so then okay that that is a way for the audience to engage the subtext is loaded up the production design has stories in the walls yeah so if so 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 the film and this story feels like it's been you know generations in the making the backstory was constantly alluded to and then at the same time come the end, the future was alluded to. So the whole thing just felt so much bigger than just two people talking, which on the page is what it was. So it was always trying to lean onto those, basically lean on to other ways we can make the film engaging um, mm. when all you've got to really use on the page is, is two good actors delivering some great dialogue. Yeah. It was a challenge. Um, like in Poofs, we really struggled with music. Mm. Is there a score in this film? Is it getting in the way? Um is the sound design too strong? Is the color grade doing too much? Um, should there be camera movement or not? Like so many things we, we talked about in trying to put this together to try and make it, to, to keep it engaging. I think we got a, it right, but it was yeah. really, really difficult. It did take a long time, but we were determined not to rush it and we yeah. didn't want to rush it. We were like, look, it takes as long as it takes. If it takes a year, it takes a year because we had to make sure that the right people were working on the right bits at the right time. And it wasn't, you know, I'd rather have waited another six to nine months and got something that we were truly happy with that represented the film correctly rather than rush something out and it not be right. Um, yeah. but, the, but the cafe itself was almost like another character, wasn't it? It was, to, I really wanted that, that cafe to have that real sense of nostalgia so that as soon as you walked in, it's, it's one of those cafes that you walk in and you go, God, I wonder who's been in here. I wonder what conversations have took place and what dealings have gone on and, you know, you just get that real sense of, I love those cafes. I always feel really at home and I want to sit yeah. there all day, soak up the atmosphere. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I mean, I, one of the things that really struck me about it as well is the kind of foresight for everything about the cafe to be 
uh, well, to be nostalgic, it gets you in the headspace of thinking about things in the past, but to also then set the film itself in the past as well. Yes. Um, yes. I thought that was that was a, a really great touch, and it seems that was kind of indicative of a kind of irony that that um, you know all the films that kind of led up to this one gradually got bigger and bigger and bigger in scale. This one comes along; it gets smaller in scale, but it kind of employs everything that's been used prior to that a lot of the tension that um that you that you get out of this film you know there there are kind of similarities to the way you slowly build tension in things like uncle joe a lot of the um allusion to things that have gone on in the past there's a bit of, of um hollow in there and you know i think there's a there's kind of a necessity to utilize those those techniques and those lessons for something like this and is is that one of the things that makes it easier also to work with um, other sort of more established act- actors? Obviously, you had um, Carl in, in Hollow, but also with uh, with Larry Lamb in in this one. I, th- I think it's when you when you when you're when the tools are taken away from you, all you've got left is yourself and the kind of the the, the story techniques that you that you've put into the script or whatever. You don't really have anything else to fall back on. Yeah, you've got your DP that can make it look great, and mm. and you've got actors that can deliver a line. But it didn't make it easier. It definitely made it harder. Um, mm. But it, it it kind of diluted everything down. It kind of you kind of took away the things that you can. It just took away a lot of comfort blankets. Like you know, there are there are moments in films where you go, that scene's not quite done it, but I'm sure you know we'll whack in some really meaty score there, and it will bring it to life we knew we weren't really going to have that in this so the performances had to be solid and the writing had to be solid and it had to look great and it, like i said before it had to be engaging it's, it's weird so for me right old windows is the first film that i think i've ever made that i didn't know if it was any good until i saw it with an audience right okay because <laughs> i was so i was so even in it laura like, when we were writing it we were like, we were like is this boring yeah. Like, are we, like, and then you get to the edit, and you go, "This is seventeen minutes of two people talking." It's just boring. <laughs> yeah. Like you're constantly worried that because you're you're pleasing yourself, you've only got some dialogue and two actors, and it's very small. So you're essentially working, and you're only really pleasing yourself. You're pleasing the actor, and you're pleasing the writer, and you're pleasing the director. But that's kind of it. You're not like pleasing the audience with these things you usually lean on. That's all you've got. So it felt we liked it. But I had absolutely no idea whether an audience would, and I was really worried about it. I had no idea whether it would do well on the festival circuit. And then we watched it, and every film I watch that I've made, you know, I'm just looking at it cringing, thinking, oh dear, this is, I've made that mistake and this mistake, and that's not mm-hmm. working. And I feel like the audience aren't reacting as I want them to. And it's, and it's uncomfortable to watch your films for the first time with an audience. But Old Windows, I, when I watched Old Windows, we watched it, the watershed put, put a screen in, a private screening on. Um, and it was a full house, wasn't it, Laura? And it was yeah. it was the first time I'd ever watched one of my films and felt like an audience member. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like it, I felt like a warmth in the room. Mm-hmm. I felt everybody leaning in. Yeah. Right. And I was like, this is exactly what we aim for. Like this it is was. actually going to play well. That's because the dialogue. That's because of every single bit of superficial dialogue. Superficial um, dialogue was loaded with a question. And what does it mean? And so you're hearing this bog standard question of, uh, you know, so do you come round? Do you, do you come from round here then? You know, but you know, she she's asking a lot more than that. She wants to know who he is, what he wants. Does he not? Does he have anything to do with her dad? What did her dad do? Has he got something? You know, does he got? Has he got something really important to say? Is he going to cause her a problem? Has he got a gun in his bag? Like, what's going on? She's got all of these questions going on. But all she yeah. can ask is, so you from around here then? You know, but you just know that she, so much is whirling in her head. And the same with Harry as well. Everything is loaded with another question that's not being said. Absolutely. How, how did um, Larry kind of relate to the to the subject matter? Was it stuff that he was able to kind of internalise? Did he have to be led to it a little bit? Or was it stuff that he was already familiar with as well? I mean... He's an old man with a past. It seems we've all got a past. Um, so he's got a lot of life experience to draw on. He's that kind of London geezer, isn't he? 
Um, yep. and, he, and he just, he was really open in the same way, like I was saying earlier on, that Laura's open emotionally to talk about this stuff. He was really open with us as well about what he needed to find to personally relate to it. And that was quite easy to find. We went, we went up to his house a few times. He came down to Bristol. We worked the script. We worked the lines. We questioned every single line. We interrogated every single line that ended up in that script. We t- and if it if it did, if it wasn't earning its place, it, it was taken away. If Larry could do something with a look, we took it away. If Laura could do something with a frang, we took it away. You know. Mm. Um, and so yeah, that came from Laura and Larry. But yeah, he, he was really emotionally open to it. And I think he needs to be. He's he, like Laura. He's one of those actors that needs that. You know, mm. and and he saw a bit of himself in the role he talked yeah. about. I mean, I won't go into detail about you know what aspects of the role he he related to personally because you know that's private. But he he needed that, and as soon as you've got an actor that needs that, you're like, yeah, okay, cool. Mm. We're now all in the same boat. We can have these really deep conversations about what all this stuff means, and then the thing just mm. feels richer as a result. Yeah, he was great. Yeah. It's things like you know that line. I love the line in the script in the film when he's talking about uh, Victoria Sponge. And we were, and he says, uh, talks about his mum. He says, never fit into, never at any of herself mind. Worried about fitting into one of her dresses. But he says it in such a way that you go, what does that mean? Mm. Yeah. Oh, what, yeah. Like, what, 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 what? Yeah. Why are you talking in such a weird yeah. way about your mum eating a Victoria sponge cake? Yeah. But yeah. the audience go, they feel that. And then before you know it, there's another question coming around the corner and it didn't really get a chance. So you're constantly trying exactly, to catch up. Exactly, exactly. You know, and as a writer, I can say that that's because perhaps he had issues with his mum growing mm. up as a kid. You know, maybe his mum was a feeder. Oh, my mum's a bloody feeder. Um, you know, maybe there was issues with his mum and dad's relationship. There's so much. And like you say, but before you, before the audience has had a chance to think about that too much, you're putting another, you're another question in front of them to think about and that's loaded up with something else, more subtext. So it's... It's it's just developing two characters that are really complex. <clears throat> and, you know, but that is being truthful because every single human being on this planet is complex. You can't, yeah. I mean, I don't know that there is such a thing as a simple human being. <laughs> you know, whether you work in Sainsbury's or whether you're, you know, a member of parliament, you, you, you've got so much complexity as a human. And that's, yeah. I find that fascinating. Brilliant. Um, guys, I could keep you on all day, but <laughs> I'm eventually going to have to let you get back to your own lives. But before we wrap things up, um, can you just tell us a little bit about sort of what your next steps are? Any new projects that might be on the way? Feature versions of stuff you got? You mentioned um, Hungry Joe already. Um, is there anything else you can talk to us about at the moment? Yeah, so we've got, well, Jackalaw Films has got two um, uh, projects in pre production. So the first one is um, a short called Safe that is a co-production with Big Buddha Films up in Sheffield. Debbie Howard's um, directing that. She's, she's a BBC director. She's amazing. So that's, that's really cool. That's about keeping women safe on the streets. It's all about violence against women. Um, it's really important. Um, and then we And called... before she moved on from that, yeah, yeah. terrible at this, Laura, there's oh, a just giving page because they're trying to raise the budget. Yes, we right. are. Giving page and look for it. We are. We do have a just giving page. Thank you, Paul. I am really terrible at this. We've got a just giving page because um, we are hoping to raise um, enough money to get the film shot. We're we're pretty. We're, we're doing all right. We're, we're getting there. We've had some some money donated from um, from the police and from various other organisations and amazing individuals. Um, so, yeah, please um, check out my Instagram page and my Twitter page, um, Laura Baston, and there'll be links on there. Um, and then me and Paul are working on When She Sings, which is an even bigger budget short film. Right. Um, we're in pre-production on that and we're hoping to shoot in October. Um, and that is going to be another kind of psychological, kind of dark, gritty horror slash, um, yeah, thing. Fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, and then a few other things in development, but yeah, that's Jack Law. Don't know about Paul. Yeah, well, Hung- Hungry Joe to feature is is trucking along, so hopefully that'll come. Um, I've been attached to another feature film recently called Wolves, which is um, pretty cool. Um, I've got a couple of TV comedies bouncing around from desk to desk. One called Whatever Happened to Pete Biscuit, and one called Ordinary Joe. And we've got another short that's um, bouncing around called The Saturday After. Um, 
that is kind of in between producers at the moment. But um, but yeah, kind of all my at the moment, the two features are kind of the two features in the two TV shows are out doing their thing and waiting for someone to to give us permission to make them. But all my eggs are kind of in the when she sings basket at the moment, which is uh, the next project with Laura, which is I'm really excited about. It's going to be good, Nigel. Trust me. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 yeah. it's a dark psychological horror that looks at small town oppression yeah. through the kind of um, through the crux of mermaid mythology. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, it's it's it's, oh, it's good. Interesting. It's good. Okay. good um, but guys, thanks so much for for taking the time out to to do this today. I've had such a great time talking to you both. Um, also, to viewers and listeners, you can watch our collection of short films from. Paul and Sam Dorr, um, many of which star Laura. Um, and you can find Hungry Joe, Shiny, um, and many more by going to cameolaunch.com slash films. And as we mentioned, the reviews for all of those films, including Hollow and Old Windows, are available on our site. So make sure you get over and, and check those out. Um, you've already told us what you're up to, guys. Can you tell people where they can find you online just for updates as well? Any social media, um, websites, all that kind of stuff? Laura, where can people find Um, Twitter website? is my thing. Twitter yeah. and Instagram. Yeah. Um, I think I'm just Laura J. Baston on Twitter and Instagram. So, And Jack of Law Films is on both of those platforms as well. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. Where can people find stuff from, from you, Paul? Uh, on Twitter, I'm Holbrook99. On Instagram, I'm Paul Holbrook Film, um, but my website is pretty simply paulholbrook.co.uk. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. So make sure you keep up to date with all developments from Paul, from Laura, and from the rest of the crew. And don't forget to follow us on the socials as well if you haven't already. So that's at Cameo Launch on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, you can also head to cameolaunch.com to watch our most recently reviewed short films for free and also to rent uh, one of the films in our lineup of films currently on the film festival circuit as well. Rentals are £1.49 for 48 hours, or you can subscribe for on demand access to the entire lineup for a mere £3.99 per month. We've got dramas, we've got comedies, we've got thrillers, we've got historical epics, we've got time travel. Uh, we've got a whole load on there. So make sure you uh, use the URL that you're seeing on screen right now or follow the link we just dropped in the description and check all of those out and get your eyeballs on some of the best short films online. That's our episode for today. So thank you again, Laura and Paul, for, for joining us. Best of luck with the uh, with the upcoming projects as well. And thank you, you guys, as always, for tuning in. Keep your eyes and ears open for our next episode. But until then, you all stay safe. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Nigel. Top man. Thank you. Cheers, guys.